record for the benefit. I have uh, one or two students who said they um, will not be able to attend today and some will have difficulty regularly attending. So I agreed um, to record these sessions for their benefit. Um, and I'll be putting them on um, a YouTube channel and I'll make that link available later on. So uh, let's get started with some personal introductions. Max Johnson, if you would um, care to introduce yourself and to say some, uh, some things in relation to what I just mentioned, if you're still there, Max. Yeah, uh, my name is Max Johnson. I'm here in Ashton right now. Um, I'm from Corvallis, Oregon. My major is criminal justice. Um, I took, I don't really know what philosophy is, but I'm always down to learn from other stuff. Um, I'm excited about this class and hopefully get to learn more about philosophy and stuff. Well, never take any philosophy. I guess not. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, Renee Lockery, if you could go ahead, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Renee Lockery. I actually live here in Ashland. Um, my major is business um, with a focus on human resource management. And I've dabbled a little bit into philosophy. Um, from what I understand, the study is basically questioning and revising moral standards, social standards, personal standards, how we think about the things that we do. And it's kind of cool. Good, yeah. So uh, rethinking, I think you said, or revising various standards. Um, that's, that's an interesting way, and I think a pretty accurate and helpful way to articulate the discipline. Um, so those standards aren't just ethical standards, but even epistemological standards, which is a fancy word that we'll um, talk about uh, at some point a little bit later today. Um, epistemology is a branch of philosophy, just um, to put it simply, that studies knowledge, the nature of knowledge. So um, the question might be, how do we know when we know something? <laughs> what is it that separates or distinguishes legitimate knowledge, which is always knowledge of the true, from mere opinion or belief, which can be uh, false by various degrees. Um, so um, thank you for that introduction, Renee. Uh, Maddie Moore, if you could go ahead. Um, hi, I'm Maddie. I'm here in Ashland right now, but I'm from Mount Shasta, California. Um, I'm a psychology major and I've never really taken any philosophy classes before, but I'm excited to learn more. Um, I don't know a lot about it, just, I guess, I know just asking the deep and existential questions, which I'm excited for. Cool. And I don't, I don't remember calling your name in the role. Are you on the roster yet or? Um, I'm Madeline Moore on the roster. Oh, okay. I go by Maddie. Uh, did I call you then? Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry. All right. I appreciate it. All right. So nice to meet you, Maddie. Uh, Blake, you can go ahead. My name is Blake Morgan. I'm in Ashland right now. I'm from Mission Viejo, California. My major is a business major. And this is my first philosophy class. So I'm excited to learn. All right. We're excited to have you, Blake. Appreciate it. All right. Um, let's see. Kylan or Kayla, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi guys, um, my name's Kayla. I'm a freshman here at SOU. I'm on the volleyball team. I'm from Salem, Oregon, and my major is elementary education. And I think philosophy is just like the study and like asking questions of life. Oh, yeah, the study and asking questions of life. Um, good, and so, <clears throat> um, can you, not to put you on the spot, but I really like the way you put that. Can you um, give an example of what a question about life might be that's philosophical? Like, um, like what's my worth? Like, what's my purpose? You know, like really like getting an understanding of that, you know? Yeah, good. So determining one's purpose, if there is a purpose or if there's not a purpose, <laughs> um, does that mean that life is meaningless or is it our task to find or create our own purpose? Um, so those are some um, important philosophical questions taken up 
from various perspectives and traditions. So uh, I'm glad you shared that, Kyla, uh, or Kayla, thank you. Um, let's see, who's next? Shay, is that right, Shay? Yeah, that's right. Butler, okay, cool. Um, my name's Shay, I'm a health and PE major. Um, I'm from Portland and I have not taken a philosophy class before. All right. And where are you right now? Are you in Ashland or? Uh, I'm in Ashland right now. I'm on the uh, running team. Cool. Okay. Nice to meet you, Shane. Uh, Jody. Hi, my name is Jody Howard. I'm from Sacramento, California. And my major is criminal justice. And what philosophy means to me is just asking them big questions, like kind of like what you said. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So what does it what does it mean, you think, to ask a big question? <laughs> um, just to put you on the spot for a second, what would separate like a big question as philosophical from a different kind of question? Um, it, yeah, go ahead. Probably something that is not like a direct answer. Like people like enough people talk about like, does God exist or not? Like I believe in God, but somebody might not. So we can talk about that and get into the philosophy of why you may or may not exist and stuff Great. like that. So perfect, perfect. Yeah. So when philosophers ask the big questions, that means we're dealing with questions for which there is no obvious or determinate answer. But of course, that doesn't mean, and this is why philosophy is so difficult for those that are unfamiliar with it. That doesn't mean, however, that we're just making shit up <laughs> and that um, any answer is right, because we'll see as we work through. Uh, these various problems, questions, and traditional approaches that there are a virtual infinity of wrong answers. <laughs> um, so philosophy is so difficult because it's set between these extremes of having no right answer that is in the singular that's quite clear or explicit in its rightness, but also having a myriad or an inexhaustible source of wrong answers. <laughs> Right, so it's not just that anything goes and it's not that uh, um, uh, there's only one correct interpretation when it comes to approaching or responding to a question in philosophy. So good, thanks Jody for that. Uh, Trinity, if you could go ahead. Hi, I'm Trinity. I'm majoring in creative writing. I'm from Lebanon, Oregon and I'm in Lebanon, Oregon. I've never taken a philosophy class but I'm always down to have an existential crisis. So I'm hype. Well, we're kind of all living an existential crisis at this point, right? <laughs> For the last year or so. We'll talk a little bit about that um, once we work through these, these introductions. Uh, so yeah, thanks. Nice to meet you, Trinity. Um, Patrick, Patrick Whitco. I'm Patrick. Um, I'm from Woodville, Washington. That's also where I'm at right now. I'm a CRIMJ major, and this is the first philosophy class I've taken, so I don't know what to really expect. Okay. And what, what town in Washington did you say? Woodinville, Washington. It's about 30 minutes north of Seattle. Oh, okay. Cool. So it's pretty close to Canada then. Mm. It's like a four-hour drive. Oh, I guess. I don't know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, all right. Karina. Hi, I'm Karina. Um, I am currently in Newburgh, Oregon. Um, I think that, that philosophy to me is probably like a study of worldview and how that interacts with reality. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, can you say more about worldview, what you think that means? Like how we perceive the world um, and how that impacts our patterns, uh, but sort of, and also just how that relates to, like, maybe we see the world differently than it actually is. Maybe our, like, everyone's own worldview impacts the way that they act. Good, yeah. So, um, world etymologically in its essential meaning means the totality of human affairs. So you might say the entire, <clears throat> oh, I like your doggo as well, Karina. <laughs> Trinity just commented on that. Um, so you might say 
our sense of the world or what we mean by world is reality as a whole. Um, and so in philosophy to talk about the engagement with various worldviews, the critical thinking through or engagement of various worldviews is to put us in a position to think our own relation as singular individuals to the whole, to the totality of reality, and even beyond the etymological constraints of the word world, which relates specifically to humans, just the totality of being. Um, so we are always already, of course, as beings in the world, in the midst of this overarching reality. Yet, because it's so inexhaustible and vast and it exceeds every measure that we impose, we can never quite come to terms with it. We never quite know what it is, but we're always already striving to get closer to this whole. In other words, on the way to it. And so um, I really like the way you put that, Karina. And did you say, I'm sorry, where you are right now and, and where you're from? I am from different parts of Oregon. I'm in Newburgh right now, but I probably won't be by the end of term because I move around a lot. Uh, also, I'm a digital cinema major. Oh, cool. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, one of the reasons I'm teaching these Zoom classes in my office rather than at home is because I have a whole gang of um, lovely but irritating animals that <laughs> are constantly vying for my attention. So um, it makes for a better class experience to get some distance from them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but I might be at home at some point. All right. Uh, Robbie Running. You could introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Robbie. Um, I'm from Hood River, Oregon, but I'm currently living in Ashland. Um, I have never, oh, well, my major is chemistry. Um, I have never taken a philosophy class, um, but from what I understand, uh, my roommates took the class last year and they said that it's kind of asking the question if something is real or not real. That's what they told me. Good, yeah, that's one of the major divisions, the traditional divisions or branches of philosophy known as metaphysics. And we'll work through all those divisions today to get a sense of what they entail. Uh, but metaphysics is this investigation into the fundamental nature of reality. Um, and so good, that's one of the major themes of our course, although since this is an intro to philosophy in general, it'll be a, a more or less broad survey of the various disciplines with less emphasis on ethics. And that's only because um, in our philosophy program here at SOU, we offer a number of, of, of um, uh, standalone ethics courses. And so uh, we don't really need to focus that much on it in this particular setting. Um, so cool, nice to meet you, Robbie. Uh, Hannah Tucker, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, I'm Hannah. I'm in Ashland right now, and my major is education, but I want to do special education, and I've never taken a philosophy class, so yeah. All right, and where are you right now, did you say? Ashland. And where are you from? Um, everywhere. I move a lot, so everywhere. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, it's nice to meet you, Hannah. Um, Charles Tang, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Charles. You can call me Charlie. I'm currently in Medford and I've lived most of my life here. I was born in Chicago, Illinois. I've never taken a philosophy class, but I think philosophy is about the rights of wrongs. When I think of philosophy, I think of, I guess, the trolley problem about which lives you save and which answers like more correct. Yeah, so I'm um, good. The trolley problem is a classic thought experiment in ethics. Uh, we won't really touch on that in this class, um, at least not directly. Um, but yeah, thanks. And I just, I noticed in the, the chat that Karina was asking about pronouns. Yeah, I apologize if, um, yeah, if you want to also share your pronouns, uh, many times you might change your name and I encourage you to do that to include as some of you have already today, your prefer preferred pronouns. But if you also want to include that in your introduction, that's great as well. Um, so I appreciate that, uh, that reminder. Okay, um, let's see who's next. Michael, Michael Sachin. And you're a familiar face from ethics in the last term. So you very much remember, I'm sure the trolley problem. Yes, um, I'm Michael. I'm here in Ashland on campus. 
I'm originally from Portland. I'm here to study data science. And from what I understand about philosophy, it's like the study of ideas. Study of ideas. Um, what do you mean by idea? <laughs> to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, just anything that provokes thought, anything that could be questioned with like reason instead of like objective fact. Okay, good. Um, so ideas maybe beyond what is available or amenable to empirical investigation or verification. And so uh, I just want to, since you use the word idea, we'll talk about this in detail in week um, six when we return to Plato. So we'll be reading the philosopher Plato a couple times in this course. Uh, but the word idea in English derives from the ancient Greek word idea, which if you transliterate the Greek to English is spelled precisely the same way. So it looks like idea, uh, but idea means roughly the field of light or the patch of illumination in which something is able to stand forth in presence as what it is to be recognized. So when you walk into a dark room and you turn on the light and you notice, oh, there's a chair in the corner of the room. You recognize this object in your presence as a chair. That's only because of the field of illumination that has made the recognition and observation, the perceptual engagement with the object possible. Yet we never really focus on the light so much. It's not something you see, it's rather a necessary condition for the possibility of seeing any determinate object. So the light kind of withdraws or hides, as it were, behind the presence of the object which you are recognizing in this perceptual relation. Uh, and so ideas in this way, as we'll see with Plato, are like these patches within the field of our own thinking that light up or illuminate the various objects and actions, events of our everyday experience such that they are intelligible, such that we can recognize them as something and rather than just discordant, meaningless chaos. Um, and so it's through ideas that we integrate our understanding of the world and that we're first even putting philosophy into an essential relation with something like science, uh, the empirical sciences, that we're even, even able to say what counts as, for example, empirical proof. <laughs> so the very concept of proof, falsifiability, verification, and so forth, those aren't empirical scientific principles, but philosophical ideas by which we can conduct science, for example. So um, to come to some scientific truth, you have to empirically verify something that's in principle falsifiable. That is, science is eminently revisable. We're constantly changing our scientific understanding of the world. And that requires ongoing proof. Yet, you can't use any existing standard of proof to prove what counts as proof. <laughs> that's a philosophical idea. And so something shows up to you as proven, um, but that's because of some prior philosophical work that has become concealed due to rote familiarity in our everyday lives. So in philosophy, we, we kind of take a step back from that degree of intimacy or familiarity, and we question or render strange what was previously so obvious or familiar. Um, and so in that way, we can free ourselves up from various prejudices, presuppositions, harmful biases, and so forth. Um, so that was a little bit of a tangent, but uh, I just wanted to build on your mentioning of the word idea there. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, okay, Shannon, um, Shannon Amesbury, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, I'm a criminal justice major with a philosophy minor. So I've taken quite a few philosophy courses before. I'm here in Ashland, but I graduated high school in Beaverton. And yeah. All right. Uh, so which philosophy have you taken before? Um, I've taken 302, I'm taking 303, I've taken logic, and then a couple of ethics courses. Okay. And you must have taken ethics with me, right? 205? Yes. So out of the 300 history of philosophy series, you still haven't taken 301 then? Nope. <laughs> That's the one I teach in the series. Uh, 
so I'll finally, I think, be able to teach it again in the fall. I haven't taught it for a couple of years now, but I'm hoping to teach it in the fall, ancient philosophy. Um, okay, so it's nice to, to see you and have you again in class, Shannon. Uh, Renee Croft, if you could introduce yourself. Hello, uh, my name is Renee. I am originally from a very small town in Oregon called Dallas. Um, I'm in Lincoln City right now, which is on the coast. Um, I'm a theater major with emphasis on performance. Um, I, ha I have read a couple like ancient philosophy things, like a some assignments a long time ago on like Plato and stuff like that, but n nothing since. Um, and philosophy to me is humans asking questions about their own condition. Great, yeah. Perfect. I love the way you put that. Humans asking questions about their own condition. Um, and you might say, and this is the view of Socrates, as we'll see on Thursday, when we begin and uh, engage with our first reading of the quarter, uh, according to Socrates, human being, the nature of what it means to be human is essentially philosophical. And philosophy is not wisdom, as we'll see as we examine the syllabus in just a few moments, but the love of wisdom, that is to say, the endless ongoing pursuit of wisdom, which means in that pursuit, we're articulating and unfolding questions, as we've said already today, for which there is no particular determinate answer or set of answers. Um, and so the kind of wisdom that can develop through the practice of searching for wisdom, of longing for wisdom, of caring about wisdom is human wisdom. And that's precisely as we'll see on Thursday, how Socrates characterizes it. And that's in contradistinction to what we might call superhuman wisdom or divine wisdom, or um, which would be oxymoronic to put it this way, a kind of subhuman wisdom. Um, and so the philosophical enterprise lies somewhere in the thick of this spacious um, middle of a continuum between two extremes, that is perfect knowledge and perfect um, ignorance, both of which from the Socratic Platonic, that is ancient Greek perspective, would be impossibilities. Uh, so that's why we find ourselves sort of in the middle. And we'll talk about what I mean in that sense in some detail on Thursday when we read um, the, the first uh, reading, which is uh, Plato's Apology. Okay, so thanks, Renee. And I really dig your space there, by the way. Lots of green. <laughs> it's very nice. It's, um, quite relaxing. Cool. Okay. Um, Alanis, did I get that right? Or did you tell me to pronounce it differently? Alanis? Yeah, Alanis. Um, hi, my name is Alanis Baldi. I'm currently in the dorms on campus. Um, I'm from a small reservation in Northern California. And um, my major is psychology, and this is my first philosophy class. So I'm not sure what to expect, but I'm excited to learn. All right, great. Nice to meet you, Alanis. Shane, Shane Blanco, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, yeah. Um, sorry, my internet was not working, so I was just able to join. Oh, no worries. <clears throat> um, my name's Shane. I'm a I'm a psychology major, and this is also my first um, philosophy class. So I'm excited. And where are you located right now? I'm located on uh, campus. Cool. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm located on campus in uh, Shasta. All right. And where are you from? I'm from Santa Cruz, California. Nice. Cool. And um, what is your major, if you have one? Psychology. Oh, you said that already. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, cool. So nice to meet you, Shane. Um, and Kevin, Kevin Burcham. I'm Kevin Burcham. I'm from Medford, Oregon. I am undeclared for my major as of now because I'm a freshman, so I don't know what I want to do yet. Um, I have had intro to ethics, so I think that kind of plays a little bit into philosophy, so I should know a little bit about it. But you took ethics uh, with me, right? Yes, I did. Cool. Um, all right. So it's nice to have you again. 
Kevin. Let's see. Um, who is let next? Michael, Michael uh, Balbuena. Hi, my name is Michael. Um, I'm currently in Ashland. But I'm from American Samoa, which is a pretty small island in the Pacific. I am a health and PE education uh, major. And yeah, this is my first philosophy class, so I don't know really what to expect. And you're a freshman, you said? Uh, I'm a sophomore. A sophomore, okay. Um, yeah, so it's nice to have you. Thank you. Um, nice to meet you, Michael. Nick Espinosa. Uh, I'm Nick. I'm from Clackamas, Oregon. I'm here in Ashland. Um, I'm an undeclared major. Um, this is my first philosophy class, so I don't really know what to expect. All right. Great. Um, nice to have you as well, Nick. Elena Barajas. Um, hi, my name's Elena, and hi. I'm originally from Eugene, Oregon, and I'm here in Ashland right now. I'm also an undeclared major, and I took an epistemology class in high school once. I can't say I remember anything, but I'm excited to learn more, so. <laughs> Cool, cool. Elena, you said, so that's how you pronounce it. Wow, that's amazing that you had an epistemology, epistemology class in your high school. <laughs> that's remarkable. Yeah, it was called um, Theory of Knowledge. And right. like, you could take it your junior year and then senior year instead of like a senior class. So mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. Cool, if you don't remember anything from that. <laughs> All right, well, we'll give you, um, I'm, I'm sure stuff will start to come back to you as we work through uh, a number of these problems and questions. Um, so I mentioned metaphysics is one of the principal divisions of the history and discipline of philosophy, uh, but there's also epistemology, and I mentioned that briefly before, but as Elena said, it's also known as theory of knowledge, uh, and metaphysics and epistemology are often intimately tied together, bound up, and that makes sense considering that metaphysics is investigation into the nature of reality, and epistemology asks questions about how we can know things, presumably things about reality. Um, so that means there's an essential connection there. And so we'll be working through a lot of metaphysical and epistemological problems and questions in tandem at the same time. Um, so it's nice to meet you, Elena. And I think we have one more, and that's it, Nancy. Um, but if I missed anyone else, let me know. But if Nancy, if you could uh, introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Nancy. I use she, her pronouns. Um, my major is psychology. Uh, I lived in Oregon my whole life, so I live in Medford. And I haven't taken any philosophy class, but I'm really intrigued to learn more about it. Okay, great. Uh, it's nice to meet you, Nancy. It's nice to meet all of you. I'm really excited uh, about and looking forward to working with you all through these um, interesting and, and difficult philosophical questions and problems. Um, are there any questions before we um, get into the syllabus and the Moodle page? Okay, then, oops. Let me pull up the syllabus and I will share the syllabus first. And then since, as I mentioned earlier, there is no required textbook and all of the readings are available for free, we'll take some time to work through the Moodle page since that's essentially where everything's gonna be for us. Um, hold on a second, my screen's all wonky. Bear with me here. My Moodle page is acting weird. Sorry. All right, I'll just have to fix. I don't know what it's doing, but try to open this up anyway.
All right, so I will share the screen and walk us through the syllabus. And I don't know about you guys, but I really fucking detest this <laughs> Zoom education. Uh, I can't wait till <laughs> get back in the physical classroom again. Uh, this is not optimal for learning, I don't think. But here is the syllabus. So some of you, I'm sure, have already taken some time to glance at it, but I encourage you to work through it more carefully on your own. I'm not going to read through all of it. Um, there's a number of, of important uh, details from the university, kind of administrative boilerplate that I encourage you to work through on your own that have to do with CARES reports, um, Title IX, uh, disability resources and so forth. I'll, I'll touch on some of that, um, but I encourage you to take some time to read through it all in case there are any questions and then to shoot me an email when they arise. So all of my contact information is located in the left column over here. So I have my phone number there. I'm, I'm, I'm often in my office so that parenthetical remark isn't quite true. Um, so you might catch me here, but the best way to reach me is, is obviously I think through email. Um, I try to respond to emails within 24 hours at the latest, but usually much more quickly than that. And so um, our Zoom meetings, as you know, are Tuesday, Thursday from 10.30 to 12.20. The link, as you found it, is on Moodle. Um, there's my email address. And um, I am often in my office, so if you want to meet me, you can send me an email and we can arrange a time uh, to meet under social distancing conditions in my office, or we can meet virtually in, in um, another Zoom room if you wanna talk about some things having to do with the course or some questions or problems. Um, just reach, reach out to me via email and we'll make an appointment. Uh, and so here are some epigrams that I give you at the beginning of the syllabus to kind of stoke your thinking in a philosophical direction. And so I use this image uh, just to thematically tie in with the approach of this particular intro to philosophy course in as much as I've organized it along the lines of, of uh, a kind of um, science fiction um, inquiry. So many, uh, this isn't always the case, but through many of the weeks we'll be engaging with uh, a particular piece of philosophical writing, and then that will be supplemented or augmented by a piece of fiction that'll be more fun. Uh, and so there is a deep and powerful and significant affinity between philosophy and science or speculative fiction. And so this Ernst Bloch quotation at the beginning here, I think touches on that relationship. So reality without real possibilities is not complete. So a lot of what we're doing in philosophy is to question what uh, Martin Heidegger, a famous 20th century German philosopher, referred to as the tyranny of the actual. So philosophy allows us to fight against or to combat or to question or to undermine the tyranny of the actual. That is to recognize that how the world is, how the world, the universe, you might say, of human affairs, how humans have carved up and staked our place in reality and achieved various relations to each other and natural environs and so forth, uh, we tend to take these states of affair and aspects of the world and of the real to be necessary or to be simply how things are. But in philosophy, we're able to recognize the contingency of these situations and of these points of reality and these um, points of, of organization and manners of structuring human concern. Um, the way that the world is currently set up is just one among many, right? And so philosophy allows us to perceive the contingency, that is to say, uh, the, uh, the fact that what seems to be so necessary and obviously the way it ought to be is just one manner among a virtual infinity of possibilities that we can pursue. And so 
connecting to that is the 20th century Jewish German philosopher uh, who also um, around World War II emigrated to the US, Hannah Arendt, who says that thinking is training the mind to go visiting. So that's what we're doing as well. To philosophize is to think. And to think, as Arendt puts it, is to train the mind to go visiting. And there is an important etymological connection between in English, and we can make this connection as well in other languages, uh, between thinking and thanking, right? So being thoughtful and being thankful. So when we think, we are open to receive that which is markedly other or different from our expectations, uh, that which is wildly and perhaps disturbingly in some cases unfamiliar, right? To attune us to different points of reality. Um, in other words, to go visiting, to go in an adventurous way, navigating this often alien landscape that we call the world and to render it precisely alien in a way that's appropriate to its essence. Uh, because as I've mentioned in a few different ways thus far, because of our everyday habitual engagement in our various activities and our concernful comportment in the world, because of that, we tend to think to take things as obvious or simply the way things are. Um, but we can problematize that in helpful ways in philosophy. And so the last quotation that I offer here as an epigram is uh, from Socrates. And this is a quotation from Plato's uh, middle dialogue in his middle period known as the Gorgias. Uh, so Socrates says in that dialogue, philosophical discussion is a matter in which even a person of slight intelligence must take the profoundest of interest, namely what course of life is best. So you don't have to be particularly um, brilliant. You don't have to be in any uh, dramatic or a continuous way gripped by philosophical questioning or the desire to engage in such inquiry to take philosophy seriously and to participate in it as a practice. So one thing that we'll gain in clarity in our understanding over the course of the next 10 weeks is that we're always already in a position to think philosophically. And we don't always do so, but there are many moments and it's difficult to prepare oneself in an explicit and deliberate way for this kind of moment or this kind of event. But we often find ourselves, and we'll talk about what these moments are and what characterizes them as um, these fruitful opportunities for philosophical and speculative thought. But uh, we often find ourselves lost, as it were, philosophically, wondering, um, as I think it was Kayla who put it earlier in her introduction, what is my purpose? What should I be doing? Uh, what is the best life I could live? Am I somehow falling short of what the best life entails? Uh, and that obviously involves everyone. So you don't have to be a philosopher to care about philosophical questions. So philosophy is something that we do, whether we're aware of it as philosophy or not at different points in our lives, but without philosophical training, we tend to do it poorly. We tend to do it inadequately. So one thing that we learn as we pursue philosophy as an academic discipline is that questions that have plagued us or disturbed us or perhaps intrigued us for our lives or perhaps in specific moments in our lives are questions that other individuals have thought through and engaged in dialogue over at different points throughout this vast intellectual history. Um, so it's an opportunity to join in this kind of overarching historical dialogue. Okay, and feel free if you have a comment or a question at any point to interrupt me uh, and just jump in. Um, or you can pose a question in the chat if you'd rather not uh, use your voice. Um, so just let me know if you'd like me to um, if you'd like me to clarify something or explain something a little bit differently. 
I'm happy to do so. So don't ever hesitate to interrupt if you're confused about something or if you want to know more about something or if you'd like to comment on something. And that's what this class is all about. Okay, so I'll just read through this overview very quickly in case there are any questions about it. So philosophers ask the big questions about our own existence, the nature of reality, the foundations of knowledge, and about what is good and what is right. From the Greek, philosophy derives from philosophia. So the verb, one verb among many, the Greeks have all kinds of words for love. Um, but one of those words is, and this is the verbal sense, phileian, to love. Um, it means more broadly than, than love in say a romantic or erotic sense. The Greek word eros corresponds to that meaning. Uh, but uh, phileian has a sense of friendship or um, affinity, kinship, kindredness. Um, so another way to put the word philosophia, to unpack it literally would be to say philosophers or those who participate in the life of philosophy are friends to wisdom. Um, they are companions to wisdom. Um, and so philosophy is our oldest academic discipline and the source from which the various fields we know today, such as history, physics, biology, sociology, et cetera, developed. In fact, the very word academic in other um, words, academia, academics, academe, and so forth, these derive from the name of the very first institution of that nature called the academy founded by Plato. So Plato uh, founded the very first, what we would call now university in this uh, Western intellectual tradition. Um, yet philosophy is not wisdom, as I mentioned, but the love of wisdom. And this means the practice of philosophy is never finished and that progress in philosophy looks different than it does in the sciences. So it's also worth noting that up until, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't until the 19th century, really, the early 19th century, late 18th century. So we're talking uh, 1800s, late 1700s, that philosophy was distinguished from science or the sciences. So previously, those whom we now refer to as scientists were called natural philosophers. And that would include people like Isaac Newton, for example. Um, and Galileo. So these were individuals who referred to themselves as natural philosophers. And so um, students also often come to this kind of class with the presupposition or perhaps even the prejudice that philosophy and science are somehow opposing practices, worldviews, or disciplines. Um, but that's not at all the case. In fact, science developed out of the fertile ground of philosophy and philosophy remains that fertile ground. So in the various sciences in pursuit of their methodological foci and research interests, when moments of crisis arise, um, this is what uh, philosopher of science Thomas Kuhn referred to as a paradigm shift, right? So an example of this would be when classical Newtonian physics was supplanted by Einsteinian relativity, the general theory of relativity, um, as a more adequate way to capture the phenomena. Now, Newtonian physics, classical mechanics, still works with the broad swath of, as we say, the mid-sized furniture in the universe. So objects that we can um, clearly engage with in perceptual ways and so forth. Um, but the empirical inquiry undergoing in physics in the 19th and 20th century gave rise to a crisis because certain phenomena, let's say celestial phenomena, were observed that didn't quite fit that. And that's to leave aside the um, emergence of quantum theory, quantum mechanics, and the recognition of the quantum field in the 20th century. And these open up all sorts of disturbing problems when it comes to how we can scientifically understand the real. And this requires a shift in philosophical presuppositions, right? So this is just to say that science and philosophy are not at odds, but they work together 
often engaging with the same phenomena, but posing different questions and coming to, um, coming to um, inquire or to relate to those phenomena in different ways. Um, perhaps we can say through different lenses. Okay, uh, so while the particular sciences advance towards their specific objects and find some degree of conceptual closure, by which I mean the representatives of these sciences know what, um, for example, in psychology, mind is, or what nature is in physics, what society is in sociology, and so forth. And these disciplines have to, in a preliminary way, have at least an operationally secure understanding of what these thematic or conceptual objects are to do their very important and, and often difficult work. So if a psychologist who wants to investigate the nature of the mind in a theoretical way doesn't have a preliminary sense of what the mind is, then they can't really conduct that work. Um, but philosophy, and there is, for example, within metaphysics and epistemology, philosophy of mind, where that kind of question remains open. We don't yet know what mind is. Um, and we'll talk about that in different moments of the course as we approach different problems and philosophers. So philosophy remains open as the critical source from which goals, methodologies, and fundamental concepts like truth, nature, reality, belief, good, etc., are subject to questioning. And for this reason, we can understand philosophy as a perpetual return to the source of thinking and knowledge, or to put the same thing differently, philosophy is a kind of eternal beginning, which is why thousands of years later, we can engage with the ideas of ancient thinkers like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and so forth, and come up with fresh interpretations, not just fresh in terms of understanding intelligibly what these thinkers meant from the point of view of their own, at this point, distant historical milieu, but fresh interpretations in terms of how to apply this profound wisdom to matters of pressing contemporary moment and concern, right? Um, okay, and so, the class will be broken up into three broad sections. And the third, the third uh, unit or section is uh, a little um, small <laughs> uh, because I usually finish up with a particular reading that I had to eliminate because we don't have a finals week as was the case in the fall. We did have a week 11, a finals week in the winter, uh, but um, so we're only gonna have really one week uh, I think it is under the third unit in which we take up, um, broadly speaking, ethical, social, philosophical, and political questions. Um, and so, as I mentioned, these themes will be pursued through the vehicle of popular, or in many cases, not so popular, science fiction. And so, uh, in the first theme, which makes up roughly the first uh, five weeks, four weeks of the class, I think it's four weeks. Uh, we'll examine issues involving personal identity, selfhood, uh, self-knowledge, consciousness, and death. Um, so who is this I that I refer to when I refer to myself in ordinary circumstances? When I say I'm hungry, or I'm tired, or um, I want to go to the beach this weekend, what exactly am I referring to? And this is an essential metaphysical question. Um, and how can we know? And this brings it into contact with epistemology. How can I know who this I is? Um, and it's a question because our selves, our very identities are constantly shifting in profound and subtle ways from the very moment of our birth as we arch towards our termination and death. And so, what is it exactly that remains unchanging such that at different moments when we're 20 years old, five years old, 40 years old, 80 years old, we can say despite these changes, there is something that remains the same. There is something that endures. 
uh, precisely what is that? Um, so that's really what we'll be occupying ourselves with during the first um, several weeks of the course on the first unit. And then in theme two, world, we'll explore the strange limits and fundamental conditions that define our world and its knowability, touching on such topics as truth, the nature of time, knowledge of the visible and the invisible, and the fundamental nature of reality. So that's really the essential metaphysical question. And then lastly, in unit three, dealing with other or otherness, we'll address moral and political questions having to do with race, gender, and technology. Um, not so much anymore uh, gender and technology because I had to eliminate that last reading. I usually end this class with one of my favorite um, living philosophers, Donna Haraway, uh, who is currently an emeritus professor at UC Santa Cruz. She lives in Santa Cruz. Um, absolutely uh, brilliant. And um, it's unfortunate, but I had to eliminate that reading. But if you're interested in it, we can talk a little bit about uh, that later. Um, okay, so are there any questions at all about this just brief overview of the, the class as I've described it so far? Okay, so to say another thing in connection to this part of the overview in which I mentioned that uh, philosophy remains open as this critical source from which fundamental concepts like truth, nature, reality, belief, good, and so forth are subject to questioning. So these are concepts, and there are many others that we could include in this list, these are concepts I call fundamental because like that field of illumination, that light through which an object is rendered intelligible and perceptible as it's present before you, uh, these concepts tend to withdraw behind the objects that they illuminate or render sensible or intelligible for our thinking and our observation. So um, we always already, from our earliest moments, perhaps, as children, have a prior that is an unchecked or preliminary understanding of something like truth. And so it'd be very difficult to imagine living and navigating this world, this reality, without recourse to the very concept of truth. We tend to take the very concept of truth for granted. We know what it is. If we didn't, we couldn't know anything else. And the same for something like nature. Uh, when we refer to something by the adjective natural, um, we all understand what we mean. So if I tell you, oh, that's perfectly natural, you get what I mean, but that understanding is obscured. Uh, it's obscured because the very concept, or excuse me, the very um, object that you might characterize or classify or define or describe as natural, such as um, a plant growing from the earth. So you might say, oh, this is a great medicine, for example, if you're a fan of like homeopathy, you might say this is a great medicine because it's natural. And you say, oh, it's natural. And I, I understand what you mean, but um, if you really dig into the concept of nature, it becomes much more profound and much more obscure, right? It turns out that Although you and I, if we spoke to each other directly, would have some operable, uh, basic, shared, that is mutual grasp of the concept at play, truth or nature or whatever else, if we spent some time discussing it philosophically, we might come to learn that we really disagree, that we have, in an, in an important sense at least, a different understanding of what these concepts are because of our own experience, our own background, our own desires, um, our own education and so forth. And so uh, philosophers um, think about and talk about what we take for granted when we think and talk about anything else. So I'll, I'll say that again, because it's important and somewhat subtle. Philosophers think and talk about what we take for granted when we think and talk about anything else. And these are candidates for what I mean by that, truth, 
nature, reality, belief. What does it mean to have a belief? How do we come by these beliefs? Is it possible to change our beliefs at will if we discover that they are somehow misguided, ill-founded, or unjustified? Or is it not possible to just intentionally alter our beliefs? Um, what do we mean by good exactly? We all want to live a good life, but what does that entail? Um, we again take for granted some prior sense or understanding what the good or goodness is for us to be able to participate in a variety of facets of our everyday and not so everyday lives. Um, but in philosophy, we can take the time to distance ourselves from what is obscured because of familiarity and call these things into question, not to undermine our basic way of living. Um, so if, for example, you believe in God, we don't want to investigate the concept of God just to transform you into an atheist, but it could serve rather to deepen and expand your prior belief or understanding rather than to overturn it or to undermine it. Okay, so does that make sense for everyone? So far, so good? Any questions? All right, if there are no questions, um, I'm just going to talk about how the course is structured in terms of assignments and evaluation. So the letter grade breakdown is straightforward. Um, I shouldn't need to comment much on that. And this is how your overall grade will be accounted for. So there are uh, two reflection papers. And when we walk through the Moodle in just a moment, I'll show you where those are. Um, and so overall, your reflection paper component of the grade is worth 15%. And I'll, after mentioning these, we'll, we'll work through the summary in just a moment. Uh, the midterm paper, so there is no midterm exam. There is a midterm paper. In lieu of that exam, it's worth 20%. The final paper, there's no final exam. There's just a final paper that will be due um, at the end of week 10, since there's no finals week. Um, and then there are weekly discussion forums worth 15%. There's one group presentation in which you're expected to participate worth 15%. Uh, there's the engaged reading assignments uh, worth 10%. And then quizzes are worth 5%. Um, and so now let's just walk through a description of these assignments. So the reflection papers, there are two 350 word maximum. There is no minimum. So if you think you can respond to the prompt in just a paragraph or so, that's sufficient. Uh, and 350 words is roughly one page of, of double spaced writing, given um, that it's like a 12 point standard font. And so each of these two reflection papers will respond to a specific question related to the assigned reading. And the purpose of these papers is to give you low stakes opportunities through the term to think through a challenging philosophical question on your own, and then to receive helpful feedback from your instructor. So these papers are graded by completion, which means if you turn in the assignment, you get 100% for it, and then evaluated by a check system, whereby uh, you can possibly get a check plus, which will be worth three points, and that will give you one point of extra credit to be applied to your reflection paper uh, grade at the end. Um, and so full credit, 100% credit for this assignment is two points. So if I give you a check, that's two points. Um, and I, I give check pluses and in instances where it's clear you did a lot of, of, of rigorous thinking for the assignment and uh, it was quite insightful and I maybe learned something um, from your own effort to think through the issue. Uh, but if you just turn in the work, you get a check and that's 100%. And I very rarely give a check minus. Um, I only do so in instances where it's clear you didn't do the reading and you're just kind of um, making shit up. Um, and so to receive 100% for your reflection paper um, assignment, you'll need four points, which means that every check plus will give you one point of extra credit. 
Okay. And this is a mistake. I didn't change this from before. I thought I had um, adjusted it. So don't pay attention to that. All of the assignments are due on Sunday night by midnight for the appropriate week. Um, so don't pay attention to that description or that aspect of this description. I apologize for that. Okay, the midterm paper. So that will be due, as I say in bold here, um, May 9th, which I believe is week five. So that's Sunday, May 9th by midnight. So the midterm exam is a three to five page paper in which you demonstrate your understanding of and ability to engage thoughtfully with the philosophical questions and issues covered during the first half of the course. And the final exam consists of a five to seven page paper in which you demonstrate what you have learned from the course and exercise your developed, your freshly developed capacities for philosophical questioning, critical reasoning, dialogue uh, with views or ideas different from your own and thoughtful self-critique. So that will be due, as I mentioned, in week 10, which is our finals week. And there's no new material for that week. So I am using it here as a dedicated finals week. Um, so all you'll have to worry about is the final paper and it will be due that Friday rather than Sunday because I'll have to have grades in um, kind of early in that subsequent week, I think Monday or Tuesday. Okay. And then discussion forum. So every week there's a discussion forum in which I present you with three questions, three prompts, and you just have to pick one and respond to it. Um, and so you respond to it by starting a new thread and then you're also expected to reply to at least one already created thread uh, from your classmates. And so I won't always join in these discussions. Um, I tend to do so much more frequently early on in the course, uh, but then as I see you guys are capable of, of carrying on these dialogues on your own, I take a step back as the, the weeks unfold. Um, and so this is similar to the reflection paper assignment. This is a low stakes opportunity for you to engage uh, with your peers in um, working through certain philosophical questions. And so if you participate in this, you get 100%, right? And if I think you could be doing better in your, your discussion forum contributions, then I'll say so, I'll comment on you and give you some suggestions. Um, okay. Then the group presentation. So, uh, and I'll show you where to find the poll to sign up for a group on Moodle in just a moment. So the group presentation after the first uh, week, so there is no presentation for this week. So the presentation schedule begins week two. And so um, from week two to week nine, there will be a group presentation scheduled for every Thursday, which will take place at the beginning of the class. And each group will be made up of three to four students, depending upon you know, the size of the class and how that cashes out. Uh, so um, I give, and, and I'll remind you guys to return to the syllabus as we approach the different presentation assignments, just to give you some sense of, of what you should be doing and putting together your presentation and working together towards that end. So, your presentation should demonstrate your effort to grapple with some portion of the assigned reading. So when I say assigned reading, I mean for the entire week because um, the weeks have two class sessions, but they're both involved in the same material, the same topic, the same question. So you can address the material for the entire week, but you should emphasize uh, more deliberately the reading assigned for that day on the Thursday. Um, and so this is a low stakes opportunity for you to think through some challenging philosophical questions or concepts, not with the whole class, as is the case with the discussion forums, but with a small group of your peers, some of whom will likely have perspectives and ideas that differ dramatically from your own. So how to carry out this is um, you should summarize central theses. So what is the main point? What is the main idea for which the writer is arguing, the philosopher's arguing, um, unpack arguments, raise questions for discussion. So you might engage the class in a kind of dialogue. You might pose questions to them. 
and strive to connect the relevant themes and concepts to layers or aspects of your own background experience. So you should draw from your own prior thinking, your own experience, your own familiarity uh, to flesh out your approach to these um, presentation assignments. So in case you are assi assigned a short story, if there's, for example, some fiction assigned for the Thursday, your group should also focus on making insightful connections between the story or stories and the philosophical nonfiction reading from that Tuesday, so from the prior class meeting. And since this is a group assignment, your presentation should demonstrate significant evidence of shared work and mutual understanding. So you're not required to use media like PowerPoint or videos or whatever, but you might consider putting um, some of that possible media to work or doing something more inventive. You might uh, create a video um, or you might share a video that you found from some other source. And then participation in the presentation assignment will result in one of two possible grades for each group member. So as a group, you will get 100% um, or 80%, which is adequate, 100% would be um, excellent. And so to assist in my giving a grade for each presentation, um, I ask that every presenter sends me a confidential email in which you just briefly describe how you went about working with the other members of your group to prepare for the assignment, um, just so I get a sense of who did what and so forth. Um, that'll help me assign an overall grade um, for the group, along with, of course, what I actually see going on in the course of your delivered presentation. Okay, and then the engaged reading, which is worth 10%, um, remember, and this is associated with the hypothesis program through which most of the readings, not all of the readings, but most of them are presented and made available in Moodle. So most of the readings in Moodle are set up through Hypothesis, which is a social annotation tool that allows a community of readers like our classroom to share and collaborate in the experience of navigating a text. So Hypothesis is really cool. Has anyone used it before in another class? Anybody? No? Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll show you how it works um, before we leave today when I, I walk us through the Moodle a little bit. So um, let's see. So this is really cool because it, <clears throat> it makes uh, an often <laughs> painful, solitary, and lonely endeavor or activity like reading, something social, something communal, something that we do together. And I think that's really awesome, especially for philosophy, which is essentially, as we'll see beginning Thursday, dialogical, right? Um, and so this is accomplished through highlighting and annotating selected passages, which others can see and reply to. Uh, for full credit, you must annotate at least two selections of text for each reading set up through hypothesis. Uh, and so I'll show you where it's marked on the reading on Moodle. It's, it's, it shouldn't be confusing for you um, for when this is required. So to satisfy that requirement, to get 100%, you may annotate the text directly, or you can respond to an annotation made by a classmate. And what counts as a good or appropriate annotation? Well, to annotate a text is essentially to comment on it and to comment. So I'm, as you maybe have learned already, kind of an etymology nerd, and it's really important for philosophy. Uh, to comment is literally to think with. So com meaning together or with others and then meant deriving from um, uh, the Latin for mind or thinking, mentation, as it's often used, or not often, but sometimes uh, preserved and used in English language contexts. Um, so comment is to think with others. And so your task here is to think with the text, so think with the philosopher, and also your peers as they're interacting with the very same text. So ways of going about this more concretely, more um, specifically include 
it, so this is what you might consider doing in terms of carrying out your annotation, asking a question about a puzzling passage. And that's where one of your classmates might enter their own annotation by helping you understand um, something that's confusing. So you can ask a question about a puzzling passage, but if you do that, I recommend that you at least try an interpretation. So if you say, I'm really confused about what uh, the writer is saying here, um, is it that, and then you can um, attempt a, an interpretation, and then that will give a kind of point of connection for others who, who, who might want to compare their understanding of this particular passage with how you have made the effort to um, understand it or make sense of it. And then they might offer an alternative interpretation which could help you see uh, these questions or themes in a different surprising way. Um, so you might also, let's see, point out the textual basis for your discussion forum contribution for that week. So one thing you can do is bring the discussion forum assignment into um, explicit connection or make it tandem with the annotation assignment, the engage reading assignment. So for example, you'll annotate the text and then in your discussion forum, you can sort of uh, refer to that area of the text that you annotated to help flesh out your answer and to ground your answer in, um, in your relation to the text. So in some textual uh, engagement. And so, Let's see, and you might interpret an argument. So if there's a particularly obscure or subtle claim or argument, you might hazard an interpretation which others can agree with or perhaps challenge. Um, you can challenge or defend an argument in the text, or you might consider connecting an idea or passage to something relevant in contemporary life and discourse, etc. Okay, so are there any questions about that? All right, lastly, quizzes. So for each week, there are multiple choice and true false quizzes. Um, they're all around five questions. So it shouldn't take you long. If you've done the reading, it should just take you a minute or two um, to complete these quizzes every week. So it's not very onerous or time consuming. And so they're assigned each week in order to test the adequacy of your engagement with the course material. And so for each quiz, you're allowed two attempts, but just the highest grade of those two attempts. So the best attempt is kept and the lowest is thrown out. Okay. So this is just a little life happens <laughs> clause uh, to just let you know that I'm quite flexible and I realize that we're all going through in different ways, a difficult time. Um, so if you need any help, if you need extra flexibility or you need an extension on an assignment, just shoot me an email and um, uh, I'm here to, to help you in whatever way I can. And then here's the, the kind of university boilerplate that I would recommend you to take some time if you haven't already to work through. Um, there's stuff on academic honesty, so plagiarism, what that means. You can find a more detailed account of that at the link here emergency notifications. So this is a remark on Title IX reporting. Uh, so I am a Title IX employer, which means, um, no, the quizzes are not timed, Nancy. That's a good question, yeah. Uh, so they're not timed. Um, but again, they should really only take you a couple minutes. Um, so they're just a handful of questions, like five questions or so, okay. Um, academic support and disability resources. So if you have a documented disability for which you need accommodations, you can obtain a letter. And, and I know some of you have done this already from the Disability Resource Center, uh, which is very helpful. And um, there's some information there for you on that. And then here's some information too for those who might uh, be in the National Guard or Reserve when it comes to active duty uh, commitments. <clears throat> or training commitments. All right, and so here is the course schedule, which you probably won't look at very often because all this is laid out 
um, pretty helpfully on the Moodle page. But um, I do have some information here on the topics. So I give you some bullet points on some basic topics that are covered. And this might help you when it comes to determining which group you want to participate in. So which reading you would like to present. Um, and so I have it laid out by week and also, so in the readings, I, I might suggest some sci-fi uh, media for viewing. Um, so for example, I, I reference Netflix's series Black Mirror a couple of times, and we'll talk about this particular episode. Um, and it'll be helpful for those who are familiar with the show during um, the second week when we turn to John Perry's dialogue next week. So you can see I have the um, course unit here at the top. So this week is introduction. And then in some way getting to this question of selfhood when we turn to Socrates on Thursday. So we're still talking about personal identity and selfhood in week two, week three, week four, and week five. And it's week five that the midterm paper is due. Um, and then after week five, we move on to the second unit of the course. Uh, titled World, in which we take up broader metaphysical and epistemological questions beyond that of personal identity and selfhood. Um, and then we'll spend some time in the world unit through weeks six um, through eight. And then in week nine, we'll turn to the last unit of the course. And that unit is other or otherness in which we address, broadly speaking, uh, ethical, social, and political problems. And so we'll be reading the work of um, the great uh, African-American sociologist, ethnographer, philosopher, W.E.B. Du Bois. I uh, will be reading um, selections from the, the Souls of Black Folk, and then also a fantastic short story, a science fiction story that he wrote and published in 1920 um, during that week. And then the final paper, as I've mentioned before, is due on Friday of week 10, which is in this class at least, our finals week uh, by midnight. Okay. So I'll stop sharing that screen. Are there any questions about the syllabus? No? All right. So if any questions come up, feel free to throw them at me as they arise. Um, so now let me just briefly share the Moodle page, but it's going to look a little weird. <laughs> so I was adjusting my screen size so I could look at Moodle as well as Zoom when I was doing the attendance earlier, and I'll have to adjust it because the left-hand column disappeared, but um, this should be good enough in case there are any questions about our Moodle. So here's where announcements will be found. You'll usually get, or you should get an email when I make announcements. Um, so uh, you have to make sure at some point that you are um, set up to receive notifications when announcements are made so you don't miss any of that important information. That's where the syllabus is that we just worked through. Uh, that's where the Zoom meeting is for each week. And I'm going to populate the shared drive with the lecture slides as the weeks go on. So you'll be able to click there. And um, once you click on the slides, even if you don't have PowerPoint, you'll be asked to convert um, because they're in a Google Drive. You'll be asked if you want to convert the PowerPoint slides um, to um, Google. And then you'll be able to access them even if you don't have uh, PowerPoint. And then here's a guide for hypothesis in case you have difficulty using that program. And then here is the bibliographic data for all class readings. So you'll use this for the midterm and final papers. So I'll call your attention to where this is on our Moodle as we get to the midterm, because um, you often will forget at that point. But this, this will be useful for when you're making your works cited page and making citations. 
as you refer to the various texts. So here is the personal introductions. Um, and so I just ask you to briefly introduce yourself and beyond other details that you'd like to include, uh, answer these questions here. So where are you? Where are you now? Where are you going? <laughs> you can interpret those questions however you like. And then using your own current understanding and without consulting any materials. And we did this today. And so you might um, sort of reiterate what you already shared with us, or you might build on that a little, or, or maybe you'll come up with a different answer. Uh, but this is important because this is going to, what you say about philosophy, this sort of pre-reflective, so um, this not carefully considered, just how you, in a pre-reflective immediate sense, coming in the first place to this class, how you understand philosophy, what you think it means, this will be an important part of the question for the midterm paper. So um, this is important for you um, for that reason, to lay out a kind of answer in the in personal introduction. So try to get to that during this, this week. Um, but if, if you're not able to this week, it's not a big deal. You can do it next week too. I'm not gonna close access to this forum. And then group presentations. So I'll just click on this. So if you click on the descriptions, this will show you the description. So what you as a group are supposed to focus on. And I see that two people already signed up for the last group presentation scheduled uh, for week, excuse me, for week nine. And one person has already signed up for uh, group seven. So um, at your earliest convenience, but sooner rather than later, please self-enroll in one of these groups. Um, so we will have a presentation on April 15th. So that's a week from this Thursday. So it's important that uh, we get some group members in there. Um, and, okay, are there any questions about that? And then here's the attendance. And so that's where I'll be uh, entering your attendance each day. And then that, now we're getting into the actual material. So here's beautiful Socrates and in week one, so we're in week one, but for Thursday, we're gonna read Plato's Apology. Uh, so this is a little, this is a very short reading. It's one page. Um, I recommend that you read through it. It's about connecting philosophy or using philosophy, thinking with philosophy during a time of uncertainty or crisis. And then this is an existential comic, <laughs> philosophy infomercial. And I think we might end today's session with that. Um, but so this is a hypothesis. So this is one of the readings that's set up through the hypothesis program. Now you see, this is a description that I provide you just to, in a preliminary way, orient you to the reading to give you a sense of what to look for, what to expect philosophically as you're working through the text. Um, because in many cases, these texts don't speak for themselves. Um, so I'm kind of speaking for them in terms of, of, of a description. And so uh, I encourage you to read this description first and then click on the link. And that will take you in this case to the web link to Plato's full dialogue, the apology. And so in bold print here, I note that this is one of the readings that's set up through hypothesis, which means that you have to annotate at least two passages to get full credit for it. And so we can briefly look at that. When you click on it, here's where you'll go. And I can see that six students have already clicked on it. And I see that there's already annotations. So that's great. So Dylan has already done a couple annotations. And while you do have um, you know, time to do this beyond our Thursday session, before our meeting on Thursdays or sometimes Tuesdays, if I see there are already annotations, as is the case for today, I'll look at these and then I'll use them um, to guide how I approach the class for that session. So I might call on you to elaborate, um, or if there's a question, if there's some or, or several points of confusion about an important passage, a claim, or an argument, uh, I'll, I'll know to spend some more time 
on that um, to give you the clarity that's needed. And so um, for this text, for the annotation, let's say you want to you want to annotate this. So it'll if you highlight it that way, you can then click on annotate. And then you can type in here. You can type whatever. <laughs> um, and then you'll click post. But in this case, I have it set up to post only to me, but you can change that and it'll go. Um, to everyone. So that's what you'll want. So that everyone who's in, enrolled in this class will be able to see. And that way, whenever um, others, your peers, click on these links to engage in the reading, they'll see that others are doing so as well. And they'll be able to see what others have made of the text so far, how they've commented on it, how they've made sense of it. Um, okay. Oops. There. Sorry, I have to get this stuff out of the way. Okay. Can everyone see the Moodle page again? Are we back on the Moodle page? Yeah? Yes. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, and so here's the, the quiz. So you click on that, um, you get two attempts again. And so the quiz will just be labeled like that for every week. And then here's the discussion forum. So I give you the directions to complete the assignment. And here are the three prompts for this week associated with the Plato reading for Thursday. Uh, and so often what we'll do in our Thursday sessions is I'll create some breakout rooms and give you guys a chance to discuss these things, these particular prompts together. And then we'll take some time as a class um, to share our, our answers or our thinking about this. And then you can use that to, um, to respond to the discussion forum assignment, or you might have already prior to the, the Thursday class session. And then you can just use what you already contributed for uh, the breakout room discussion. Um, so we can kind of use those together. Okay. Um, and then you can just see how it goes from there. So this is the reading for next week, John Perry's Dialogue on Personal Identity and Mortality. So that's John Perry. Um, so this is another text that requires an annotation. There's the quiz, the discussion forum. Week three, so uh, for Tuesday, we're gonna read Descartes, um, the first two meditations. Then for Thursday, we're going to read Avicenna, and the short story by John Pollock. And these are very short. The Descartes reading is about six pages, so it's quite short. Avicenna is one page, and the Pollock reading is two pages, um, so they're very short. Here's a short story by Robert Heinlein um, that takes up the, the philosophical problem of solipsism, um, which we'll talk about. So if you don't know what that means, that's okay. Uh, but that's optional, so I'm just la leaving it here if you, in case you're interested and you want to read it. And then I just want to show you where the first reflection paper is. So there are the two reflection papers. The first one is due in week three, so April 25th. And you can already see the prompt for it now. So you can already start thinking about it if you want. Um, so I give you the prompt there. Um, and then in week four, so that's how the readings are again. And then in week five, uh, that's when the midterm paper is due. And you can already see the prompts and the uh, details for this particular assignment now. So you can start preparing for it now. And notice that there's no discussion forum assigned for week five. Uh, and that's to give you guys more time and um, opportunity to work on your paper rather than miring you down with too many assignments for the week. But there is still, in addition to uh, the midterm paper, there's still the annotation assignments for engaged reading for week five, but I've eliminated the discussion forum for the week as well as the quiz. So there's no quiz or discussion forum for these weeks. And then in week six, we are leaving the first unit of the course, um, self or personal identity, uh, or transitioning to the second unit of world in which we uh, read Plato. <laughs> 
and James Baldwin together. Um, so some of you are probably already familiar with Plato's famous allegory of the cave uh, from book seven of the Republic. So we'll be reading that. Um, and um, in juxtaposition with James Baldwin's essay, Stranger in the Village from 1955, in which he reflects on his strange experience of being the only black person to have ever stepped foot in this small Swiss village. Um, and so it's, it's very interesting, I think, to put these texts, one modern, one ancient, together in this context. Um, okay, so we're running out of time, but are there any, so the, hopefully the Moodle page makes sense to you guys, but are there any questions about it at this point? Any questions about the Moodle page? All right, so then before we go, as I mentioned, let's, <laughs> um, well, let's look at this existential comic as just a fun way to end class. Uh, so I'll be sharing several of these comics. Maybe some of you are already familiar with them, but we'll be using these throughout the course as they're appropriate. Um, <laughs> And so this is a philosophy infomercial that features Socrates, whom we'll be meeting on Thursday, and uh, a 20th century British philosopher, Bertrand Russell, um, whom we won't be reading at all, but I will mention him during uh, week, I think it's um, seven, he'll come up. But so just take the time to read through these panels and I'll tell me if I'm going too fast as I move through them. All right, <laughs> well, hope you enjoyed that. And we are out of time. Um, oh, I noticed, sorry, there's a question from Shane. Do you want us to have all the readings done before Thursday class? Yeah, so the idea is you should have the reading done. You don't have to annotate it yet necessarily, but you should have the reading done prior to the class session in which we're scheduled to discuss it. So for Thursday, before you come, you should have read um, Plato's Apology at that link, uh, which just to, to let you know, and this is explained in the introduction I wrote up for the piece, apology doesn't mean <laughs> he's apologizing. Uh, apology derives from the word in English comes from the Greek apologia, which in that context means defense. So it's really Socrates's defense. Um, and he's defending not only himself in this um, factually existent trial, but he's really defending more importantly for us the practice of philosophy, the philosophical lifestyle. So that's why we're reading it um, during this first week. So, okay. Yeah, and then all of the homework, so the assignments that you have to complete are due Sunday by midnight, just to avoid any confusion. So everything is done at the same time. Um, all right, any, any final questions before we go? 
All right, guys, it was good to meet you and I look forward to seeing you again on Thursday. So um, just shoot me an email if you have any problems or questions and I'll see you then. Have a good week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.